While I make every effort to broadcast correct information, I'm also still learning. I will double check all my facts, but realize that healthcare is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or healthcare provider may have a different way of doing things from another. I welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. I take no money from supplement or device companies. By listening to this podcast or reading this blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice or to treat any medical condition, neither yourself or others including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your healthcare provider for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast or the website. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or blog or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Boss Body podcast be responsible for damages arising from use of the podcast or the blog. This blog or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limiting to, limited to establishing the standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or the blog. What's up, guys? It's Dr. Tim Jackson with another episode of the Boss Body Podcast. For those of you who have been following me for a number of years, you know that I'm very big into epigenetics and methylation. I was first introduced to it back in 2011, 2010. I did some studying with Dr. Kendall Stewart in Austin, Texas. And, you know, he taught me about methylation, MTHFR. And gradually, you know, the knowledge base has grown exponentially um, for providers and uh, health patients alike out there. So today, uh, you know, I, I've seen, I've worked with patients with methylation issues. Um, it affects so many different areas of your physiology. People think that it's just, you know, oh, you take it during pregnancy, but it affects, you know, your CD4, CD8 white blood cell count. So your immune system, um, your neurotransmitters, how you detoxify. So I found a very special guest, uh, Ms. Hannah Went from True Diagnostic the epigenetic company. Uh, she's a 25-year-old genius, kind of like the female version of Bugie Hauser in functional medicine. And so welcome to the show, Hannah. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Tim. That was such a kind, you know, welcoming and, and entrance. So I'm, I'm super excited to, to be here and chat with you today. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about, you know, I know you went to undergrad at the University of Kentucky. Did, were you exposed to methylation research there? Not really. No, I remember maybe seeing, you know, a couple pages in my general biology books of, hey, this is what methylation is a little bit, maybe in biochemistry, but um, in terms of epigenetics too, you know, not much, maybe again, just, just that definition. So this, this world was foreign to me even three years ago, which seems crazy to, to say that out loud. Right. Absolutely. And so what moved you in the direction of epigenetics? Yeah, definitely. You know, I've, oh, I, I don't have a very unique story, I guess. Um, I've always been interested in science and biology. Really, that's my, my passion, my background. Um, graduated from the University of Kentucky, like you said, and became super interested in actually becoming a genetic counselor as, as my career. Did some undergrad cell signaling and uh, different uh, cell uh, mechanism-based labs in undergrad as well, but um, didn't end up taking that route. I actually took a route at a compounding uh, pharmacy a little bit outside of Lexington, Kentucky that really specialized in unique peptide products. So I worked there more as, you know, just trying to sell these, these products, created a nonprofit called the International Peptide Society to educate uh, healthcare providers about these products we created. So that was the first time I ever knew the preventative functional kind of cash pay healthcare space ever existed where you actually treat healthy people instead of people who right. are already sick. Right. right. Um, but we always wanted a way to quantify how these peptides in these products were working. So we saw the first paper ever come out in August of 2019, proving you can reverse epigenetic uh, methylation, biological age. And that is what started the birth of true diagnostic. And we were like, you know, let's set up a lab. And, and, you know, that that's kind of the story from there. We built a lab in Lexington, Kentucky, where 
CLIA certified. We checked kind of all those rules and regulation boxes and uh, ran our first sample in July of 2020 and have tested around 20,000 uh, patients to date. That's amazing. That's really a great story. How arduous was the process of starting a lab and going through all the red tape, you know, the CLIA certification, et cetera? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, not easy, I would say. Not an easy process. And to be quite honest, we did not want to open our own lab. Um, we actually flew out, met with a couple people, some researchers out of UCLA who are really pioneering in this field, Dr. Steve Horvath, um, if you know some of your listeners may, may know of him, and even a couple companies out in California to try and partner with them because they're like, please, you know, we, we don't want to do this. And um didn't really find anyone who, who saw our vision or, or kind of met our needs. So I, I'm just so thankful that we ended up setting up the lab here. We do a lot of other, you know, third-party processing for some academic partners and, and other types of, of testing as well. So as rigorous as it may have been in the morning, uh, or excuse me, in the um, process, um, mm -hmm. you know, I said morning because I just remembered I would stay here until two or three in the morning, actually making sure we had the right consumables, you know, going through, making sure we met all those rules and regulations. Um, I, I think we're just, you know, very happy that we ended up making that decision. And then how did you introduce your testing to the functional medicine and wellness community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, we already really had this unique audience, right, from the pharmacy that that I talked about. That that pharmacy was, um, again, really the one that that brought these peptide pharmaceuticals to market, um, was the fourth fastest growing company in the nation. So we had this really unique group of healthcare providers and really tried to transition everyone to using this testing because you know, a lot of these, these healthcare providers we worked with are anti-aging, but you know, how can we manage something if we're not measuring it? Right. I'm sure you've heard that quote before by Peter Drucker. So, um, we actually launched all of our testing on March, uh, 2020, right before COVID happened. So it was actually probably the worst timing ever. Um, but I think we sold about 6,000 kits initially, initially. So we knew people were interested in that there was a market out there. Um, you know, it, it, it was pretty difficult with, with COVID being there and whatnot, right? Preventative healthcare wasn't people's first, first concern at that time. Um, but then we, we did start to notice a trend and people starting to be interested in this. And, you know, now biological age is, is a huge trend word. It's a huge fad right now. So it's, it's really taken off in the space. Yeah. So, you know, one thing I've heard over the years being in functional medicine since 2010, 2011, you know, we talk about telomere shortening. So what's the difference between measuring, you know, biological age uh, via telomere shortening versus CPG or methylation islands? Yeah, another great question. These, these are all fantastic. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to measure biological age. Back in the day, they actually used to measure your biological age by how many cigarettes you smoked which is a very, very crude measurement. So these epigenetic methylation markers and the telomere lengthening or shortening, if you will, are both ways we can measure the biological aging process. Telomere length used to be the gold standard. It's actually been studied so many times. I think it's been the most studied uh, hallmark of aging out of all of them available. Now, what we've noticed over time, though, is that they're not related to that many outcomes, unfortunately. So I joke, you know, they've been studied so many darn times because we still don't know what the heck they do. Um, right. so, so, so they're just not predictive, really. You know, Dr. Tim, if I came to you and said, hey, I have a telomere length of 7.0 kilobases, you would say, okay, right? There's, there's, yeah. there's not much there to, to grasp as it relates to our health. Um, I don't want to count them out completely. They are still important. We know as they do get shorter, um, we, you know, our, our, our health starts to decline as well, but that connection just isn't that strong. Um, so these epigenetic methylation markers, what we noticed with these is they're going to be much more precise, much more accurate, and much more sensitive compared to your uh, telomere lengthening. So okay. I, I think we are seeing again, that huge shift away from, from telomeres more to these epigenetic methylation based models. Awesome. And uh, people who are using your test kits, are they getting actionable information in terms of, you know, stress mitigation, sleep hygiene, you know, uh, toxicity levels, things like that, that they can do 
and then they retest, say, six to eight weeks later and see a change. Exactly right. Yeah. So there's so much we could talk about here. Um, this is what most people are interested in, right? Okay, I have a baseline. I understand my aging. What now? So True Diagnostic in particular, we offer a suite of longevity-based biomarkers, I would say is, is what we like to call it, because we would be doing epigenetics a huge disservice if we only said it could offer these biological age outcomes. So we give you things like your overarching age, age of your immune system, immune cell subset, pace of aging, telomere length, even because it's still important. Um, and with that, you know, as, as much as I love epigenetics and obviously I'm very passionate about it, it's still so new. So the interventional trials are far few and in between, but we are learning. Um, again, that first clinical trial came out in August of 2019. Um, but we mainly work with healthcare providers in this space, just like yourself. So these, the healthcare providers we're working with are gathering a lot of covariate data. They're doing the most cutting edge, you know, interventional, um, procedures and techniques. So we can actually learn what's moving these markers. Um, I really like to see the treatment framework almost broken down into like four different categories, almost think of it like a, a food triangle or pyramid, so to speak, where on the bottom, you have your lifestyle factors. And like right. you said, stress, sleep, uh, insulin sensitivity, you know, we got to make sure we're not smoking, try and lower that alcohol consumption as much as possible. Um, exercise, uh, diet, things like keeping a healthy weight. Oh, and you could even do an entire epigenetic detoxification program, right? Where you're getting rid of plastics, um, getting, you know, water filters for your water filters, kind of cleaning your environment up. Um, so I think doing the lifestyle factors is absolutely necessary. I know that's pretty boring and no one wants to hear that. Um, but yeah, I've probably done, you know, more report reviews out there for epigenetic methylation aging than, than anyone in their life would like to, I, I very, very much enjoy it, but the people who have the best aging are usually doing all of those things, um, you know, correctly. Right. And so just for the audience um, to know the difference between your company and say 23 and me, you're not looking at say COMT polymorphisms and MAOA, you're looking at the actual biomarkers, right? Not it, the, the mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I, I think that's a really good distinction to make too is um, you know, your genetics is like you said, your COMT or your MTHFR, kind of your genetic sequence. So that basis, that's not going to change. Whereas your epigenetics, epi uh, is actually a great prefix, little fun fact, it means above. So we're looking on top or above the genome. And those DNA methylation markers that we're looking at are going to control the expression levels of your genes. So a lot of people think of it as a light switch. I think that's a, a you know, really good comparison. I like to take it a step further though, and think of it as a dimmer on a light switch, because it's not always all the way on or all the way off, but it may be, you know, somewhere in the middle or somewhere in between. And I, I think it's also important to state that methylation in our case, when we're looking at your epigenetics is not good. It's not bad. It's really dependent on the position that you're looking at. So you want your oncogenes or your cancer genes to be methylated and, and turned off, meaning, right, they're not expressed, but you want your, um, you know, tumor suppressor genes to be turned on. So you want those to be unmethylated. So it's very, very site specific is, is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Can you give us a case study example, say a dramatic difference in chronological age and biological age and if they were able to modify that biological age through therapeutic intervention? Yeah, I actually had a healthcare provider, this is great timing, yesterday, um, who I reviewed their report with, and it, it was their report, he was an MD, and um, I don't get to do that many longitudinal analysis um, report reviews, just because usually the healthcare providers are like, oh yeah, I can interpret it this time, I'm good to go. But I was so happy I hopped on a call with him and his baseline wasn't great. Uh, you know, he had pretty much accelerated aging in, in almost every kind of age related category that we saw. He had uh, pretty short telomeres. He had a fast pace of aging. He had a higher overarching biological age. And when he retested, I'm not kidding you, 
every single metric was decreased. Um, and it was lower. Um, so I was, I was just like, what the heck did you do? I, I need to know what you did. Um, and what he told me, and, and this is subjective data, we can get into some of the clinical trials, but what he told me specifically is he went through a synolytic process or protocol. So, um, I'm not sure if your audience is familiar with senescent cells or, you know, synolytics. Um, really not. If you can just kind of operationally define that real quick. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, um, senescence, we have, we have these senescent cells in our body or people call them zombie cells as well. Um, there are these cells that get stuck in this cell arrested state. So, you know, they're getting ready to go to autophagy. They're getting ready to die after they've gone through their cell cycle, but they're just stuck and they can't die. So, so that's what a senescent cell is and a good amount of senescent cells is healthy, right? We don't want our cells to continue to replicate over and over and over and over again, that could lead to, you know, cancer or different diseases. Um, but we don't want too many because if we have too many, we have a lot of oxidative stress. We have a lot of inflammation. Um, and we know those, those aren't good for the body either. So we, we need this really nice, healthy balance of senescent cells. And we do start to see senescent cells also increase as we age, right? Remember the definition of aging being deterioration over time, our cells get confused and they start to look at each other and their signals, you know, get, get all, um, kind of messed up. They're, they're, they're sending signals to the wrong parts of the body. So what this healthcare provider did was, um, a, a combination of, of different synolytics. He, he went pretty strong. Um, so he did a combination of things like your, uh, typical flavanol. So your, your physotin, your quercetin, resveratrol, tyrosteelbine, some curcumin. Um, the reason I say he took it maybe one step higher is because he, uh, th those that are all named are supplements. Um, he also took dasatinib as well. So dasatinib is an, uh, FDA approved compound for chronic myeloid leukemia in cancer patients. So, you know, helping clear out some of those senescent cells, but it's, been studied, um, several times at very, very, very low doses to be a synolytic too. So the Mayo clinic did a trial in 2019, looking at a dasatinib and quercetin combination, um, and true diagnostic actually did a clinical trial as well. Um, looking at that same thing, but half of the dosing <laughs> from the Mayo clinic to see if we could still get a signal. So he went through this pretty rigorous, uh, senescent protocol. I think he did a little bit of, um, an epitalon peptide as, as well, which is, is known for, uh, lengthening telomeres, but, but also does a, you know, a, a couple of other things to the body. So, um, yeah, just some, some, you know, supplementation medication, um, little peptide injection and, and saw really, really great results. But I just love that you asked that question because it literally happened yesterday. So that was a, a good one that came to mind. Yeah. So, you know, I, I talk to a lot of providers all over the country and all over the world, I'm, as you do as well. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get your thoughts on rapamycin, which, you know, for listeners is an anti-aging drug. It's used in transplant surgery to modulate the immune system to prevent rejection. But have you had any providers or patients, group providers who have taken rapamycin and seen improvements in their biological age? Yeah, absolutely. I think subjectively, we've seen pretty good results overall with rapamycin. I would say we favor rapamune, which is going to be uh, more bioavailable compared to rapamycin. So if you can, can check out rapamune, um, I, I think that would probably be the better route to go down. How do you now, spell that? R A P P A M U N E, rap immune. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. <laughs> um, and I could send it to you too afterwards. Um, but, but yeah, you know, su subjectively, it's great. My functional health care provider, she said, Hey, I take six milligrams once weekly. Will it hurt me? Well, I can't, you know, overtake it right. And put, put my body in this, this immunosuppressed state. Um, will it help me? I don't really know yet. I'm not sure about the research. And I think that's where, what we're thinking right now in the epigenetic methylation field as well is yes, subjectively, we've seen some really good differences, but from a clinical trial perspective, um, unfortunately there's nothing available yet. So, um, there is, there is a trial called the Pearl trial. Um, unfortunately, um, they haven't, I, I, I think 
they, they don't get enough funding. So it'll start and go and, and, or start and stop, start and stop. So we're collecting samples and we're biobanking them. Um, but we'll proceed with that when, when they gather some funding as well, looking at before and after biological age testing with rapamycin. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that very thorough answer. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about uh, measuring DNA or looking at DNA biomarkers, we're referring to nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA, correct? Correct. Yeah. So what we're doing is we are taking a blood sample and we are going to be taking um, just on a blood spot card, very small from a finger prick. You can use venous blood if you'd like, pipette it on that blood spot card. Um, and we're going to take it through our process of you know, just typical extraction quantification. Um, and then a really harsh process actually called bisulfite conversion, where we're actually denaturing the DNA and breaking it up to highlight those methylated positions. Um, yeah. So we're taking DNA from the blood sample. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Is there anyone looking at mitochondrial DNA? Oh, I, I don't know, actually. Um, I I'm sure they are. Um, I'll have to research on that as well, because, you know, there's a lot of companies out there. Um, you may have heard of like grail, like the Holy grail, right. They actually look at cell free DNA in the plasma, um, for really early stage, uh, cancer detection markers. Um, so I, there has to be a company out there looking at that. I'm, I'm sure there, there is, but yeah, I'm going to have to do my research on that one. Yeah, absolutely. I just figured if anyone on the planet knows that you would probably know. And we talk a ton on the podcast. Almost every guest has talked at least a little bit about mitochondrial health. And I also work with a medical device company um, that has a transcranial photobiomodulation, red near infrared light that shines on the prefrontal cortex, you know, yeah. to get the mitochondrial ATP production up. Um, yeah. But I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole. I want to stay on, you know, topic with what you're doing day in and day out. How yeah. much can uh, patients expect to pay for your testing services? Yeah, online, that uh, one of the products that we offer is called a triage complete kit. That is where we measure about a million um, different methylation markers. Um, and that is going to come right now with about 10 different reports. Um, we always update those reports. So, you know, your, your data is forwards and backwards compatible as we find something you know, from 10 years ago that was created, we can apply it to your data set. Or if something's mm -hmm. created in the years ahead, we can also provide you with new and updated information. Um, so that one's $4.99. Um, and then we do have a cheaper kit called the True Age Pace. And that one only looks at your Dunedin pace of aging. So how quickly you're aging at this very moment, and then the telomere length as well. And that's $2.29. So I would say most people are going to opt in for that complete collection as well as a baseline. And then they're going to follow up. Uh, you could follow up in as little as eight to 12 weeks with the true age pace if you wanted to, um, or, you know, put, put six months in between each test as well. Um, but yeah, Dr. Tim, I, I think I can definitely get you, you know, a discount code even to give to your listeners, um, yeah, as well. If you wanted to give them one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I think a lot of people will be interested. You know, a lot of people are doing you know, different therapies, whether mm -hmm. it's IV therapy, taking supplements, you know, cold plunges, sauna, and they want to see, you know, have they moved the needle and they want to kind of get a baseline. And so oh, yeah. I think that would be great. You mentioned the term, uh, I know what it means, but for listeners, can you describe the Dunedin? I think that's how you pronounce it. Yes. I've been corrected so many times. It's supposed to be an emphasis on the E like done and pace. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, trust me, been corrected from my, my healthcare providers out in New Zealand and, uh, the, the people we work with. Uh, but this is my favorite one to talk about. This done pace is an algorithm that true diagnostic exclusively licensed from Duke and Columbia university. And it was created from a study that took place in Dunedin, New Zealand. That's why it's called that weird name. Um, there's also a Dunedin, Florida um, that I learned about. But what they did in this study is they took about 1,000, 1,037 to be exact, Dunedin, uh, New Zealanders that were born in 1972 and 1973, and they studied them across their lifetime. So that's just a birth cohort. Um, 
birth cohorts typically aren't unique, but there's something very, very unique about this one. And it's that they have a 96% retention rate. So 96% of the participants who were born in 1972 and 1973 are still involved in the study today in 2023. So just fascinating. Uh, the group's yeah. actually 52 years old uh, this year. Mm -hmm. that, that really is amazing retention rate. Yeah, because like a good retention rate here in the States, and I guess I just didn't know how how low it could be is like 60% if you're lucky. So um, yeah. it's pretty crazy. But 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 basically in the study, what they did, um, and, and you know, have to give all of the thanks and credit to Dr. Terry Moffat from Duke and actually her partner, Dr. Avshlam Caspi, who work on this project together, which makes it even, you know, that much more more cool and, and interesting because they're just lovely people. Um, they studied this group and they noticed wow, some people are aging in different ways, right? Um, and, and they're gathering all these biomarkers and they're able to actually create an algorithm, the Dunedin pace, um, which tells you how quickly you're aging biologically for every one chronological year. So it's uh, on a scale from 0 0.6 to 1.4. If you were at one, you'd be aging one biological year for every chronological year. So that's like in the middle. Um, we wanna be lower though. When we're lower, we reduce our risk for almost every single chronic disease and death. We have better balance. We have better gait speed. We have better grip strength. Uh, we appear to look younger as well, right? Um, we all know some people who look like they're 50 uh, that are actually 30 and, and vice versa. So this, this Dunedin pace metric is by far the golden standard when you're measuring anything as it relates to longevity in the clinic and in research as well. You'll, you'll, you'll find it in almost every single paper that is coming out. Um, looking at, at aging or biological aging. Wow. That, that's really unique. And so you've seen people who get down to 0 0.6 on the Dunedin scale? Yes, I do. Um, I don't know if, if Dr. Tim, I've ever showed you this. Have you heard of the, the rejuvenation Olympics that we're doing? I saw it on your Instagram, but I haven't had a chance to review uh, it yet. Okay. Well, since you asked about the lowest, anyone who asked about it, I have to talk about it. So we actually um, partnered with Brian Johnson, who's, who's an entrepreneur, very well-known um, businessman, um, and uh, Dr. Oliver Zolman, who's a very um, high-level healthcare provider over in, in England, um, partnered with them. And using the Dunedin Pace metric, it's called the Epigenetic Leaderboard Rejuvenation Olympics. We compare uh, your three tests. So you have to have three Dunedin pace tests and the first one and the third one have to be at least six months apart. And we compare how low you can get it. So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the number itself, um, but the, the percentage of change within each of those, right? So, so how low can you get your Dunedin pace essentially from your baseline? Um, so yeah, you know, I, I've seen people at, at 0.6 and I still encourage people who are at 0.6 to keep testing because, you know, you want to maintain it. You don't want to right. want to stop there. Um, but the the change that we've seen with Brian Johnson's before and after test are are absolutely phenomenal. Um, he has held the number one spot, um, I think, since we created it, which was like January or February. <laughs> so he's number one. You can see, you know, the top twenty five kind of listed there. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really really cool. And so, how long is that going to go on the Rejuvenation Olympics? Oh. Forever, I think, I hope. Oh, okay, so it's not <laughs> it's, like a finite period. Co correct, yeah. So every month we update it. So, oh, there's, you know, new players in the game. These people moved here or whatnot. So, you know, um, it being early in the month when we're recording this session in, in case, you know, you publish it later. Um, we just had a couple other people move to the top, like Steve Aoki, who's a, you know, really famous DJ. Um, ben Greenfield moved to the top as well. So this is all public information. So, you know, mm -hmm. they, they consented to, to have their names up there and whatnot. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, we even, even the patients that we test here at true diagnostic, you can, um, if the clinics allow the clinic's name will be next to the patient too, that the patient's going to, um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of clinics who are doing a lot of the cutting edge stuff and, and we can actually see those positive changes through the Dunedin being captured. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, that's really, really cool that you guys are doing that. Now I can tell you're very passionate. Your enthusiasm, you know, sort of <laughs> comes through the screen. And I think, you know, that's awesome. It's not just, you know, something you read or you're just coming to nine to five and doing at a lab, but you know, you're personally invested and super interested in it. And I think that, you know, speaks volumes and 
that comes across. So kudos to you for that. Yeah, definitely. You, I, I had someone once tell me like, you know, if you're excited to open your laptop in the morning and kind of get after it and stuff, um, yeah, you should be, you know, really thankful for, for where you are. So I, I, um, am really, am really lucky to, I, I spend most of my day or my day to day, usually speaking with healthcare providers, either, you know, onboarding them, teaching them how to use this test, what it actually means, why does it matter in their clinic? You know, if they, if, if there's not that why, then they, they shouldn't be using our testing. So, um, right. really kind of, kind of going through that process. And then secondarily, um, you know, teaching them how to interpret these results as well, and even monetize it and, and create different packages or programs. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I've created a lot of lifelong friends, colleagues, and, and kind of have this community, which is, which is awesome. That's great. That, I mean, that's fantastic. And to do it at such a young age, I mean, you know, I was just talking with Dr. Jerry Bailey, uh, well, last two weeks, and, uh, you know, he had nothing but, you know, glaring reviews for you. So, you know, you have a great reputation in the functional medicine and integrative medicine space. Uh, let me ask you this. So yeah. the healthcare providers that you speak with, you know, you see different themes, common denominators. You mentioned Fisetin. Um, the how do you pronounce the active form of resveratrol, the sirsulabine? Oh, the the tirostilbene. Tirostilbene. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say are the most common? Is is it bisetin, rapamycin? Oh yeah. Um, I I think I I may tell you about a different um uh clinical trial that you would like. Um because I think this is a, a, a really popular one too. Um, actually, you know, I, I'd be the first to tell you that I'm obviously obsessed with epigenetics, but it's not the answer um, to everything. We need to look at everything from a multiomic layer. So there's a study that came out and I love it because it combines genetics and epigenetics. And what they actually do and well, what they found is that women in particular with the MTGFR 677CC variant and then men with the 677TT variant have accelerated biological aging. So they're like, whoa, we found this connection. You know, obviously that's, that has to do with the methylation pathway. Well, what they found is if you supplement with a methylated cofactor, like your 5-methylfolate or your methylcobalamin, a hypermethylator, um, you almost instantaneously reverse the biological aging. So I, I really love that study um, because it talks about our hypermethylators, but it also has a really good image in the study. That's like a, a seesaw where you also have to have some of your hypomethylators as well. So hypermethylators are adding methylation, turning things off. Your hypomethylators are taking things away, turning things on. So under those hypomethylator categories, that's where you have some things like your, your flavanols, the resveratrol, tyrosteobine, the EGCG green tea extract. So I really like when people combine that with even some, some methylators as well, if needed, we don't want to over methylate or, you know, under methylate anything. So it's good to, you know, check those methylation pathways, do that genetic testing as well on top of the epigenetics. So the compounds that you mentioned on the, well, your right side of the seesaw, they help uh, take you from the more hyper state to the more hypo state. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, I I like to think of it as we need to shift our methylation markers in our favor, right? We we need that good, healthy balance because we don't want to, yeah, turn things off that don't need to be turned off. Um, and we don't want to turn things on that need to be turned on. So it all kind of has to has to balance. And you know, once you regulate your genetics, if you ever get your genetics tested and you understand the variants you have, you're going to see that shine through the epigenetics as well. Right. So, so everything is, you know, on strings and, and, and pulling at each other. Um, so I like to look at it as more of, you know, a, a systems, uh, kind of effect, but, um, maybe to, to answer your question, um, a lot of our healthcare providers though, uh, that I talk to at least are using the things like the rapamycin, um, or rap immune, the metformin, even things like the GLP one, like the semaglutide and terazipatide too, and a lot of those peptides. Well, it's interesting that you bring up, well, let me ask you this on the cut for a second. Mm -hmm. You said checking your methylation pathways to see how they're working. Do you mean looking at the polymorphism to see if you're heterozygous or homozygous, or what type of markers are we talking about? Are these Correct. tested on your test? Oh. Yeah, to see if you're heterozygous or homozygous. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yep. the, you know I've seen some people who are homozygous, but it may not be expressing per se. 
Mm. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't know enough about that testing, um, or, or the results there to, to make anything or, or to say anything definitive. Um, but I just know a lot of our healthcare providers do that testing to maybe see if they need supplementation with those cofactors. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're homozygous for listeners, if you have two copies of, let's say C677T, the mm -hmm. MTHFR variant, um, then you're going to want to supplement with methylfolate and methylcobalamin. And then how would you know when or how much, or is there a way to know when and how much to supplement with the bioflavonoids and things of that nature? Yeah, it, I guess it always, I guess it depends if you believe in over supplementation. Um, I don't know. Uh, I really, I really don't know there. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that as well. I guess I say to my healthcare providers, Hey, it, believe, it depends if you believe in over supplementation and then we move on. But I think I need to hear a little bit more from them. You know, people say, Hey, you don't want to take too much vitamin D, right? Um, you don't want to take maybe too much, uh, yeah, resveratrol, uh, quercetin, et cetera, or you even want to, um, cycle, right? Like a, a couple months on a couple months off. So, right. um, yeah, I guess from a clinical trial perspective, we don't really know. Um, so yeah, I, I, over, you know, if you believe in over supplementing, maybe take the breaks back a little bit um, every now and then. Yeah, the reason I asked is because, for example, uh, not to confuse listeners, but if you have the COMT polymorphism, you know, you may be a little sensitive to methyl donors. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to give too much methylfolate and they may not be able to tolerate methylcobalamin, at least not initially. So that's why I asked that question. Yeah, that, that's why I just think again, it all goes back to multiomic testing, right? Like you, yeah. you need to test your genetics to understand that. Um, you can't get that with our test. So um, I think doing both and combining them, especially a, a lot of my healthcare providers I speak with are usually gonna do both at baseline and, and use them hand, hand in hand. So um, yeah, you know, Knowledge is power. I, I want to know everything about myself. I know not everyone's like me, right. um, but I, I would do all of the testing in, in the world. Yeah. To figure out, you know, my, my underlying biology. Yeah. The more data points, the better. And as one of my mentors said, you know, you can't treat a gene, you know, it's good to look at the SNPs, mm -hmm. but also look at the expression, see if they're expressing, because you may have someone who has, has no copies of a SNP, but they may have a lot of toxicity, a lot of stress. And they may act physiologically and biochemically as if they have that polymorphism. Conversely, you may have someone who's homozygous for a SNP, but who lives a really healthy lifestyle and that's really not expressing very much. God, yeah. So you said you can't treat a gene. Was that what you said? Yeah. Oh, I like that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to quote you, but yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, you're, you're, uh, you said you're, you learned that from someone else as well. I like that. That's really good. Yeah. Dr. Kendall Stewart in Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, okay. And I think, you know, based on the early work of Amy Yasko, um, with kids with autism, mostly mm -hmm. looking at the polymorphisms, you know, some of them might be on 20 to 30 supplements and, you know, just because you have the SNP, it may be expressing, but it may not be. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, I think for our intents and purposes, yeah, it's about balance and the multiomic viewpoint, the 30,000 um, foot viewpoint and looking at ground markers, you know, like the testing that you're doing, things like organic acid testing, um, the beta glucuronidase, which is an enzyme that deconjugates estrogen in the gut. And so if you have COMT and you have elevated beta glucuronidase, you're going to have estrogen dominance. And so, mm -hmm. you know, looking at multi layers, multiple layers there, I think is extremely important. What yeah. would you say is the biggest surprise that you've come across or learned or experienced since you've opened True Diagnostic? Oh, and in and, and what fashion? Like anything? Uh, yeah, anything that you've learned that just like, well, blew you away. Oh, that's hard. Um, I, I think something that, that blew me away. So, so one of the things we do, you know, our main, our main, kind of channel of selling these kits. And, and the first thing we wanted to do was, was make them available to healthcare providers. Right. Um, and then having the lab, I think one of the biggest surprises was how open academic 
our, our academic partners are um, to collaborate and to work together. I know that may seem like a, a little bit of a silly answer, um, but we are a main processing laboratory for, you know, a lot of, of different universities um, because they don't even have the infrastructure at, at their own kind of, um, yeah, in their own lab. So um, it is just so refreshing, refreshing and nice to have people who want to collaborate and want to be involved and want to look at the data and learn more about what these methylation markers are telling us. It is still so, so early. Um, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. So I, I, I think we didn't realize how many people are researching this and, and how exciting it is. So um, that just uh, obviously makes us very happy here at True Diagnostic to see that we're going in the right direction. So for example, a couple of our, a couple of our collaborators at Cornell actually came and visited a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, um, it, it, it was just very inviting to have them come see the facility, uh, work with them a little bit deeper. We actually published our first paper uh, with Cornell in, um, frontiers looking at COVID-19, longitudinal COVID-19 and methylation markers before and after as it relates to those age outcomes. So yeah, the, the willingness of people to come together and share data and just make this more available um, for everyone, I think um, is the end goal. So that, that, that was just uh, super surprising to me. I thought it'd be very difficult to work with, with them and, and you know, yeah. creating all these terms and contracts. Yeah, I can speak to, you know, the rigidity of the ivory towers of academia. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, they'll say, oh, there's no studies, when really what they mean is they haven't read any studies. Yeah. So just go to PubMed, type in, you know, this phrase or this word. They're like, oh, there really is. I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, you don't hear about it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So yeah. that's great. Briefly, tell us a little bit about like the size of your facility, the number of employees mm -hmm. set up, kind of describe it for us. Yeah, so we're located in Lexington, Kentucky. Again, just to to reiterate that, so not the bio capital of the world by by any means. So that's pretty unique. Um, we have about a twenty thousand square foot building, so it's it's relatively large. Um, most people, I, I typically work downstairs. I'm in our cool podcast room right now. Um, but the offices downstairs, um, probably have about 10 to 15 people down there. Um, you know, business development, uh, me director of operations, a couple of our bioinformaticist, uh, marketing and some administrative, uh, people as well upstairs. Um, we have our lab director, our lab manager, and I would say the good majority of, um, the employees here at true diagnostic are going to be our lab technicians. Um, and we couldn't do anything without them. They're the ones, you know, running the samples because we don't outsource to any third party. So we have probably about 15 laboratory technicians as well, um, running those samples, you know, day in, day out, coming in early mornings, late nights, even in on the weekends. So super, super thankful for all the work that, that they put in, but, uh, you know, always growing the team. We have a couple of people who are remote too. Um, our new bioinformaticist, Natalia, she's from Spain. We just hired her and awesome. she's been great. Um, and then we have Annie, our, um, head of research who is in Louisville, Kentucky. So not that far away. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So what's one thing or two things that you know today that you wish you would have known eight to 10 years ago? I know you were only 15. Then. <laughs> yeah, I guess even just like a year ago, um, if I could tell myself something is you know, just do it. Like, just go after it, like message the person, you know, reach out. I know we got in touch off of Instagram, I think originally. Yeah. So I've always been more of like a nervous person, um, perfectionist, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, they're not going to like me if it's this color or this shape or whatever, just get started, put it out there. Um, that's what I did with, you know, my brand, everything epigenetics. And I've made so many connections, um, even on top of, you know, all the connections and, and colleagues and friends I'm making from true diagnostics. So yeah, you know, I, I, I wish I would have gotten started like five years earlier. Right. And, and just kind of following, uh, yeah, your, your intuition and just doing it. I think, um, yeah, especially in, in starting a business, you know, it doesn't matter if, if, you have that bow tied on top and it looks perfect. If you have a, a product that is the most scientifically validated out there and, and you start to talk to people, um, you know, it'll just snowball. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us. You're a wealth of knowledge. Hopefully we can have you back on at some point in the future if you're yeah. open to it. 
and yeah, definitely. Uh, look forward to, you know, doing the test and uh, I'll have Marcel reach out um, for the uh, discount code and um, keep up the great work. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Tim. This was awesome. I appreciate all the kind words and uh, yeah, I couldn't thank you enough. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.